Welcome everybody. My name is Loretta Cohen and I am here tonight representing Westchester Communities That Care. We are an organization that partners with the school district to bring this parent speaker series. Uh, earlier this year, we had um, a presentation by Mainline Health called It's Okay Not To Be Okay. Uh, last month, we did one with a professor from Rutgers University on technology and addiction. Um, and tonight we have Carol DeMarco from the district who will be sharing with us some tips and tricks for healthy communication in our homes. And um, all of these um, recordings from these presentations can be found on our YouTube channel, Westchester CTC. Um, so just be aware of that. And if you're on our website, which you are because you registered for this event, you'll get links to that after this a couple of weeks from now, I'll send them out and you'll be able to access everything. I did want you to know a couple things about us before we get into our topic tonight. Um, we have one more session, parent speaker series session coming up at the end of November, and that's called QPR, which stands for Question, Persuade, Refer. If you haven't yet heard of this, it's a suicide prevention training session. It's two hours, hour and a half, two hours. And it's been delivered by the district actually to all the incoming ninth grade classes over the last several years, not pandemic, <laughs> but before that. And it was delivered this year to all the ninth graders. Um, it's a great training. I'm a big fan of it. It helps uh, parents, teens, anyone um, recognize the warning signs of suicide ideation or, you know, the potential for suicide, just like you would with CPR. Um, so that's going to be on November 30th. And um, like I said, you'll get a follow up letter with an introduction to that. And you can register for that on our website as well. Um, also, we are starting up a parent outreach committee to try and look at these subjects and how we can move them forward uh, beyond the night of having a, you know, an hour presentation by an expert in the field. Um, how do we move beyond that as parents in the greater Westchester area? How do we help support one another? How do we support our kids? Um, so if you think you'd be interested in being a part of that parent outreach committee from Westchester Communities That Care. Um, definitely, I'm going to put my email address in the chat. Um, and again, everything, I'll be sending you stuff, emails and things that will all have my contact information on it. Um, but reach out. We are having that meeting on uh, that first meeting on December 3rd at noon at the West Goshen Township Building. And the last thing I wanted to lead you with, leave you with is this flyer that you're looking at now. We have, that's, I just mentioned our parent outreach. We also have a youth outreach component um, and we're working with some really great kids in the area right now. There's a handful of kids from a bunch of different schools who try to put together different activities that they think will help promote positive choices and positive behaviors among their peers. So um, they're organizing a youth leadership day uh, on Martin Luther King Day, and this is for eighth through 12th graders. So if you have anybody in that age range that you think might be interested, these kids are just always looking for ways to use their graphic design skills, video making, even just their social media skills to help influence their peers in positive ways. Um, so it's really great. And again, for any of this stuff, you can just reach out to me. I'm going to throw my name and email in the chat right after we're done here, uh, right after I introduce Carol and uh, that chat or our question and answer box is a great place for you to um, give any questions you have while during the presentation. Feel free to throw things out. Carol's happy to bob and weave, answer questions answer, as she answer goes. Answer at any time, yep. <laughs> Carol is a veteran counselor in the Westchester Area School District. She's at Pierce Middle School. Um, she's done parent presentations for us before, and they're always fabulous. So um, we're really happy to have you here teaching us all a little bit how to do a better job with communication. All right. I um, appreciate that, Loretta. I think a veteran counselor is the way to say that I'm an older older person, but I appreciate the way experience. you said that. Experience. Experience. <laughs> yes, definitely, ex definitely experienced. Um, 
So I am so happy that you have joined tonight. Um, I have a very short time. I'm going to probably speak quickly, but um, I'm here tonight to talk about healthy family communication. Um, I would like to start by, let me see if I can go to my next slide. Who am I? Um, personally, I am the mother of three adult children. Um, I'm a grandmother of one. She is six weeks old. She just sent me a text, my six week old granddaughter that said, good luck, Grammy. Um, I am a resident of Westchester for the last 31 years and generally just a nice person. If you know me and you love me. Um, professionally, I've been um, with the Westchester School District for 23 years um, as a middle school counselor at Pierce Middle School. So I've been working with kids for a long time. I'm also after hours an academic coach. I facilitate for a program, program called Strengthening Families, um, which is a great program for people that it's a free program that people can um, avail themselves of. And I love public speaking. I, I do like speaking more um, in a front of a live audience with a microphone. If you know me, um, you know that I love a microphone. Um, the tonight, what we'd like to do, what I'd like to have you leave with is that you would understand what effective communication is, that you understand various stages of child development, because, because I think that um, when you're communicating with different um, ages of children in your family, uh, it's important to know how their brains are developing and what they can take in. Uh, most importantly, and what I wanna get to pretty quickly is learning practical strategies to enhance family communication. I think when you come to these, presentations. I don't like it to be dry. I want you to leave here with things that you can use and that you'll go back and say, oh, what was that that she said? I have, I do a lot of things that are kind of sound bitey um, at school. I call those for the kids pearls of wisdom, which are called pals. Um, it's kind of like uh, Emeril Lagasse does bam and I do pals. Um, so hopefully those pearls of wisdom will help you with your family communication. And lastly, I am always trying to inspire people to be the best version of themselves. And in this case, to um, be the best caregiver that you can be. Um, uh, my so much to say, so little time. Apologies if I speak quickly. I uh, interrupt if you have a comment or question, or you can put it in the question and answer box or in the chat. I have lots of information. Um, it, I, I don't have a problem that I'm thinking, oh, what should I say? The problem I had was to cut it down to something that would be organized in an understandable way because I have so much I wanna say, um, but I'll try to be succinct. Um, these are not new concepts for you, I'm sure, uh, but they're rather reminders and maybe a different way of looking at things. I do a lot of reframing for kids in my uh, practice with, at, at Pierce. And I like to give people a different way to look at things. Always looking to raise self-awareness. When we're looking at our communication in our families, I think we need to be self-aware of what we're doing and what we are trying to do with our, our uh, children uh, and families. I think that that uh, necessitates a level of honesty that it's only amongst yourself and in your own head, but I'm gonna ask you tonight to be honest with yourself when we're looking at some of these um, different ideas. Um, so let's get right into it. What is communication? Um, this is the dry stuff. Um, it's a process where we share our concerns, our ideas, our feelings, usually to do two things, connect with others, or we're attempting to get our needs met. Um, we communicate all the time, unfortunately, not always effectively. Um, it is a skill that we have not been uh, generally taught. We kind of pick it up on our own. And depending upon our families of origin um, and our experiences in our lives, we may not be very good communicators. I'm sure in your lives, you can think of people either in your families or in your work situations or your social circles where people are very good at communicating and very bad at communicating. Um, so we, most of us don't have great communication skills. Um, but we hope, unfortunately, we hope that we don't communicate that well, but when it comes to our family, all of a sudden, magically, we're going to be great communicators and um, have this great communication within our homes. And that's a little bit difficult. Um, what I want you to realize is that this is a process. We are all works in process, and I really believe in the growth mindset, which suggests that change is possible. So if we believe in that change is possible and we put the work in, 
you may not be good at communicating yet, or but that, that, that big yet is a part of growth mindset that you can say, it's not, I'm not good at communicating, it's I'm not good at communicating yet. Um, so that tonight um, you are putting the work in and you are looking to get some tips. Perhaps you wanna enhance your communication. Perhaps you're already great at it, but you want it to hear other things, but we're putting the work in. So let's be honest about our communication skills. Let's remember who we are dealing with when it comes to our children. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about who they are. Um, and let's learn some practical strategies to move forward. So um, many times when you talk about communication, verbal and nonverbal. Verbal are the words we use. Nonverbal is the body language, the tone, volume, and voice. Very important, and I put it in bold, that studies show that 93% of our communication is nonverbal. Only 7% is from the words we say. So we need to remember that when we're talking with our children um, and, and our spouses and anybody in our families, our, our parents, whoever we're dealing with, that the face and body and our tone and volume, our space, um, our, how much space we're giving someone, all those things are really um, speaking louder than our words. So I want you to, to remember that. Um, the other thing is there's expressive and receptive language. To have communication, it's a two-way street. So expressive is what we're putting out. Receptive is what we take in and how we understand and very importantly, perceive the messages. Because sometimes you know in your lives, you put something out and somebody perceives it a different way. So communication would, um, mean that if you're having the back and forth volleys, you may be able to correct the misperceptions of your, your um, messages if you're speaking um, back and forth with somebody. It, this is all very important when thinking of communication with your children. Um, let's reflect on our own communication styles here. There are different ways to look at your communication styles. Are you assertive, aggressive? passive aggressive, manipulative or submissive. And oftentimes we're not just one of these. We may be very assertive at work, but very submissive at home. You might be aggressive with your spouse, but passive aggressive with your children. It's, it's you slip in and out of these. And I have a graphic here to describe some of these. It's not the most uh, clear here, but assertive is what usually people are aiming for. It's reaching your goals without hurting others. You can express your emotions. You, you have a good eye contact and you speak with a balanced tone. Aggressive, we all know those type of people. It's more hostile and dominant posture. Um, usually you speak in a higher tone and pitch. Passive aggressive are those people who a lot of times have a very sweet and innocent persona and you must think that, oh, they are so nice but they really can zap you um, behind the scenes. They have hidden agendas and they can go from very nice to very aggressive in a, in a moment. Manipulative, um, and, and I think that some of these, uh, passive aggressive and manipulative, I would say a lot of times sarcasm is used and I, I, I am not an advocate of sarcasm. I know that that's somehow, sometimes how people um, use humor, but um, that, that can be very manipulative, sarcasm. Um, submissive are the doormats. They just, I don't care, whatever you say. All of these have pros and cons, but um, certainly the assertive would be the one that we're looking to, to be most often. So let's look at who our children are. That's a little bit about communication. And as I said, I'm trying to get through this so we can get to the practical strategies for you. I put down these, I don't know the ages of the children, your, your children, of the people that are here, but you need to know that there are various stages of development and oftentimes the zero to two, which my granddaughter is in right now. I mean, obviously um, we know that those are the infants. Um, three to five is a very rapid time of, of um, growth and language is being learned and independence is being um, brought to the forefront in this area. I'm. Um, I deal more, most with six to 18 year olds. Um, six to 11 year olds, you need to understand that they are having a lot more social comparison. They've started, they are starting to, especially at the latter end of that age, 
individuate, which means that they're starting to have their own ideas. Um, social relationships are, are much more important. And then in 12 to 18, um, they start having a, their own abstract concepts. Um, they have a sense of invincibility. Um, that's when adolescence begins. Uh, adolescence begins and, and at around 11, but goes to 25. And that's something if you haven't heard before, I hope you hear now, because for those of you who have children who are a little bit older um, and even adult children, um, they are still continuing to grow. And what I'm talking about when I'm saying that, I wanna share this next um, slide here is brain development. You need to understand that the brain develops from the back to the front. So one of the things that you're seeing uh, on this slide here is the amygdala in ages 11 to 18 is getting very defined and that is where emotions are kept. That's why you see your children at those ages um, act, you know, snapping and, and being very impulsive um, with their emotions because that is heightened at this age. Unfortunately, at the same time that this area, the prefrontal cortex, because that's the very front of the brain, the front of the brain has not been developed yet in, in many um, of our teens. Um, and so that is where thinking, reasoning, logic, inhibition, um, they're not fully developed. Planning, um, knowing consequences, understanding that rules, consequences, um, that's not developed. So you're, you're seeing a lot of emotion without some, I think of a horse being reined in, without those reins being developed. I say this to you because while we're talking about communicating in our families and especially with our children, you have to understand who you're dealing with. They are not mini adults, even though some of our teens or preteens might start looking like that and might start sometimes even wanting to act like that. They are not adults. They are still developing their brains. It's not um, within their realm of possibility at times. This is something that if you've heard me speak before, I have developed, I don't know if you know Punnett squares from genetics, but um, Punnett squares are where you, you take the different genes and you put them together, the, the alleles, the dominant and recessive genes, and you put them together. This is a good way to think of your children. So on here, the parent is at the top here. When your children wake up during the day, on a particular day, there are days that you wake up, the parents see this little arrow here, and you would like your child to be an adult that day. You've just, and again, I'm thinking at this point of um, kids who are 11 to 18, but even when you're dealing with three to, 11, you, can, you want them to be more responsible. You want them to be able to do something on their own. But think of your preteens and teens. Then there are days that you really kind of are like, oh, my little 12 year old, I really kind of want them to be my little Joey or my little Sally. Um, children also wake up some days thinking, I'm kind of a big kid today. I'm an adult. I want to be treated like an adult. But then there are days that they wake up and they say, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just I'm just a little kid. So here's the Punnett square idea. So if you take adult, adult, the day that the parent wakes up and says, I want my child to be an adult, and the child wakes up and says, I want to be an adult, here, this circle, this square here, adult, adult, you're probably going to get along pretty well. Also, the day that the parent wakes up and says, I really want my little, little Joey here, and the kid wakes up and that's how they're feeling too, that's this square down here, child versus child and child probably going to get along pretty well. The rub comes when you wake up and you want your kid to be an adult, but they wake up and they want to be a child. You have a lot of conflict. Same over here. You wake up, you want them to be a child, but they want to be an adult. You have a rub here. The unfortunate part of this is if you look and do the math, that means only 50% of the time are you on the same page. So the next time you're having a conflict with your child who might be six to 18, and you're wanting them maybe um, as, a, as a six year old to, you know, do their chore and do their, you know, maybe eat their, their food by themselves, and they're not doing that, 
they may be regressing to the childlike behavior. So it's good to stop and think, where is this conflict coming from? And is it coming from the fact that we're not on the same page? So that's just a little graphic that I wanted to show you. Um, here are not the practical tips, but certain things that I want you to, um, in a healthy communication in a family, you need to be present. Um, children, I've dealt with kids for, for the last 23 years. They will tell me, and I know that they're on their phones and laptops a lot. I know that. But sometimes they're not. And they have told me, you know, my, my mom, dad, they're always on their phone. I can't get their attention. Um, try to converse with them. I talk later on in this uh, presentation about not doing the dance of asking the same questions and getting the same answers. That's not communication. That's not conversing. That's doing a dance. Converse, Have be interested in what they are doing. Join them where they are. The example I give of this is my son who is now 31 was a gamer. I was not into video games. Um, I would sit with him behind him and watch him play World of Warcraft and look at his guilds and all this thing. And he would talk to me about it and I could care less, but he didn't know that. We used to walk up to get bagels together on Sundays and he would talk to me about all his guilds. I would be glazing over. He realized that one day and said, mom, you know what? On the way back, I'm gonna quiz you on this. So you better better pay attention. So he, you know, he loved that I know that, knew that about him, those things about him. Uh, model, model, model. If you would like your child to be communicating well, you need to watch how you're communicating. And that's why I asked you to reflect on your communication style. How are you communicating with your significant other? They are watching. Children hear everything you say, but they mimic everything you do. Give them a good example. I know that's hard to do when you're tired and it's not you know, it's not at your forefront. We, none of us can do this perfectly all the time, but try to remember how are you communicating with others? That's not just your significant others or the other children in your house, but at the grocery store, um, you know, with, with your friends, all of those kinds of things. They're listening to how you're communicating on your phone. Uh, are you modeling good language and kind words? Are you being a gossip and spreading rumors? They listen to that because I know that because they repeat them back at school. And I can tell that it's coming straight out of the parent's mouth. Do you model positivity? I'm big about positivity. Um, you model that and you will see that. You model poor communication and you will see that as well. So just be self-aware. Um, lastly, but not lastly, probably more, more than anything is creating a safe space. Kids are not gonna communicate with you if they do not feel it is safe to communicate that it's a respectful, tolerant place where they can say things and not be criticized and yelled at. Um, we do have authority as parents and we need to use make proper use of that and not use that as a power play. Um, so proper use of authority and in that know your intentions. Are you saying something intentionally because they've hurt you and you're, again, this is self-awareness. Are you, do you know your intentions of why you're saying what you're saying and how you're saying it? Non-judgment is big. And I'm gonna give you some practical tips for that. One of which is let them vent and validate. Vent and validate. They can, you, you listen and you let them vent and you validate without judgment. Um, so everyone, I say this often to, to people, everyone wants to be understood and appreciated. Life to me boils down, relationships boil down to me for everyone wanting to be understood and appreciated. You can understand that as a person in your relationships with um, others. It's the same for kids. And sometimes what ends up happening is we feel taken for granted or our children feel taken for granted. And that means they're not being appreciated. Sometimes we're not understood. And we feel that, I'm sure you can understand that as, as a human person, a being, but so can they. So I always say, listen first. Your children, my, your children tell me all the time, I just want my parents to listen. I don't want them to fix it all the time for me. I just want them to listen. A great strategy for that is when they tell you something, you, before you go to fix it mode, just say, 
are you just telling me this because you need to, to vent and tell me that? Or do you want me to help in some way? And a lot of times they will tell, tell you, I just wanted to tell somebody. They also tell me they don't co go to their parents a lot of times because they're afraid they're going to jump into fix it mode and make it worse. So if you tell them, you can tell me things and I'm not going to jump unless it's harm to self or others. Um, I'm not going to jump to action unless I get your okay to jump to action. Always listen first. I can't stress that enough. This is the appreciated part. Don't take me for granted. I more that I know more than I let on. I see more than I realize, and I care more than you can imagine. Kids, I know you think sometimes, well, they're supposed to clean the room. They're supposed to this. They're supposed to that. We all like getting recognized for the things we do. Sometimes you might be taken granted, of, uh, feeling taken granted, being taken granted of because you're cooking all the time. Well, they might think, well, you're supposed to cook, but you'd still like somebody to say thanks for the meal. So maybe they get up on time all the time. Say, I really appreciate that. I appreciate you as a whole sentence. I appreciate you. Wonderful sentence to tell your kids. I appreciate you. So, ooh, so you may feel like I've given you practical tips already, but here comes the real practical tips. Here are a lot of things that um, you can take and use in your families. Wait, what is she talking about? Wait stands for why am I talking? This is one that will prompt you to listen. So if you're listening and all of a sudden you go into lecture mode, first of all, you usually can tell you've done this when your children glaze over and they are shaking their head and in their head they're saying, okay, I just have to wait till this, do they're waiting for it to be over. You can then just maybe keep this on a note card on your refrigerator or somewhere around. You need to say to yourself, oh my goodness, why am I talking? I should be listening now. Zip it. Wait. Why am I talking? Use why am I talking. It's great. Here's another good acronym. Love this one. And you could click. I know some people who've heard me talk before are going to go, oh, I love this one. Q-tip. Q-tip stands for quit taking it personally. Very hard to do with our families. We generally take everything personally with our families. Taking the emotion out, especially when you're dealing with your children, is very hard. That's why I can deal with other people's children at school much better than I can deal with my own because I have emotional baggage with my own children. We all have this emotional tie to our children. We want to have that. But at times, as the adult in the relationship, we need to remind ourselves, Q-tip, this has nothing to, be, to do with me. This has to do with my child's hormones, my, you know, that my child's tired, that my child got dumped by their boyfriend, that their child, you know, it doesn't have to do with you. And if you can start taking that emotion, I do something at school with my kids that can be used at home too, if you can perfect the technique. When they go emotionally high, I really, even, even my posture gets, I lean back. I'm like, you know, I have a kid come in and say, Mrs. DeMarco, I need to talk to you. There's something big. It's big. It's big. I kind of sit back and I go, okay, Tommy, what would you like to talk about? Inside I'm going, oh my gosh, what is he going to say? Oh, this is awful. Oh. But outwardly my body language is okay. And they might get more and more escalated and I go down the other way. To do that, I, you know, obviously at work, I don't take it personally, but at home, quit taking it personally. This is a great one with your spouse or significant other or at work. Um, so you can use this anywhere. Quit Q-tip. This was one I talked about before. Converse, don't interrogate. Interrogation is a lot of yes or no questions. Um, it's a lot of, well, you know what an interrogation looks like. Um, it, it's somebody coming home and you're like, where were you? Who were you with? Why didn't you come home? What you, it's like, 
rapid fire questions and you don't even give them a chance to answer. Conversations are a lot of open-ended questions, a lot of asking more questions. So your, your student, your child comes home and says, you know, wow, something happened at school today that in, in, in class and my teacher really got upset rather than um, what did you do? Did you do something? What happened? You know, you just say, oh, that must have been interesting. Tell me what happened. And then they'll, they're much more willing to talk with you if you're not interrogating. Um, what, you, what questions you ask your children actually communicate something to them. A parent who gets a child who is worried about their child um, having social issues at school, when they get in the car and the first thing you say to them is, who'd you sit with at lunch? Did anybody talk to you? Who's out with you? Did you talk to Sammy in, in English? You're communicating to them. You're worried about that. You know, so watch how, what questions you're asking because that communicates things. But have a conversation with your child. And this is the stop doing the dance I was telling you about. Stopping the, doing the dance, the biggest dance I think parents do with school age children is this dance. Kid comes home, drops her backpack off. Parent says, how was school? Child says, fine. What'd you do? Nothing. Do you have any homework? No. Did it at school. Okay. That was not communication. That was you checking off the box that I talked to my child about school and them checking off the box that I checked in with my mom about school. That's not communication. That's a dance. And there's different ones we do with our kids. Um, and you probably would recognize your own dances, but rather than do a dance, have a conversation. How was school today? Okay. Oh, what did you do in science today? I don't know. Well, you know, I think last week you were learning, learning about fro frogs and amphibians. Um, did you do that today? No, I think we moved on to a new unit. Well, what unit? Oh, that's interesting. You know, have a real conversation and don't just check off the box. Oh, this is a big one. So if any of you have 10 to 18 year olds, talking back is a big thing for you. It is for all of us. And it continues. I have a 26 year old. Sometimes she still talks back. My reframing of this for you is at 10 to 12 and even further, your children are just finding their voices. So if you might reframe this, that they're finding their voices and they're not yet adept at using those voices. So that rather than heightening your emotions and being like, stop stassing me back, try to hear the underlying message that they're telling you when they sass you or talk back and maybe reframe it for them as well as it sounds like you're pretty angry about that. And, and, and rather than attacking their um, delivery and taking it personally, listen for what they're trying to tell you. And a lot of times at that moment, it is probably anger or frustration or hurt or disappointment and try to reframe it back for them in those, in those terms because we get hung up on their delivery and shut them down totally without even giving any credence to what they were trying to say. So try to reframe the talking back in your own mind that, you know, I have to give them a chance to learn how to use this new voice that they have just come to find. Communication journals. Um, I have found with, with students at work, at, at school, but also with my own children, um, you can do this as early as they can write. I started this with my one daughter when she was in third grade. We went out and we picked out a, a notebook and um, she picked out a Tweety Bird one. She's now 32, she still has that. We have fun reading back some of the things she said. Um, but it's a journal that doesn't have very many rules to it other than when you wanna put something in the journal to each other, you write in it and you put it on the other person's bed. And there's no obligation to write back. 
if you want to, you can. Um, and if you don't want to, you don't have to. And when it, and then if, if they don't write back and you say, want to write something else, you can go get it. Um, I will tell you, I did this with all three of my children. And the one who continued it the longest was my son. I should have known he was going to be an English major and, and he wants to be a writer. But um, this was a very good tool for communication. It doesn't always have to be verbal um, because they were able to talk to me about things in the communication journal that they felt uncomfortable talking to me face to face with because sometimes I would overreact. It was good for them because it gave them a buffer and they could write things. A lot of times, like my daughter would write, I have a crush on a boy at school, but she was worried to tell me that. And it gave me the chance to read it in my room and go, oh my God, it's happening. Oh, but I would have that reaction by myself, process it, and then write something back when I was ready to write something back. So it gave that buffer for both of us. Um, you know, <laughs> interestingly, my oldest, who I thought would be the one who would do it the most, didn't. Um, my son did it the most, my other child. But I will tell you that when I was going through a divorce situation, that all three of them at different times pulled out that journal and told me the same thing. Can we use this journal for something else other than writing about what you and dad are going through? Because I guess I was using it to try to get to feel out how they were feeling. And they all were able to say to me in the journal, we have other things going on in our lives too. What a great vehicle to communicate. So that was really helpful. Um, I don't know if any of you are overreactors, um, but I was an overreactor and my kids ended up coming up with a safe word to use with me. Meaning if I'm going to say something to you, mom, that I think you're gonna freak out about, we're gonna say, we all decided on the word and Again, I thought it was gonna be something like sparkle. And my son said, sanctuary. So we used sanctuary for a while. Um, the funniest time my daughter used it was when she put um, liquid detergent in our dishwasher. And she turned the dishwasher on and the bubbles started coming out and she ran into the other room to, say, to tell me and said, sanctuary, 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 sanctuary. Um, cause she was like, she's going to freak out, but they also use that again, kind of like the communication journal. Once they were able to trust that that word worked and I, they would say it to me and I would take a deep breath. Okay. Once they use, learned to trust that, um, they would use that to talk to me about really serious things. Um, and it, it was just a nice way to create that safe environment for them. So um, I don't even know how long I've talked. Have I talked a long time? Loretta, have I talked a long time? I don't know. Uh, you're good. Um, but as long, yeah. I, we do have one question up here and it okay. was from sort of the beginning. So, okay. Um, well, what's the question? So the question is what will be the pros of the, when you were talking about the types of communication of the manipulative way yeah, of yeah. communication. Now, I would think that the, I, I was um, being a little oversimplified with that. Manipulative and submissive, probably um, passive aggressive might make feel, somebody feel good for the moment, but um, really this manipulative, <laughs> the pros are if you're a lawyer, <laughs> <laughs> you probably, you know, do very well with that. And, and maybe I think in, in different situations that might help. I know, I do not think manipulation is, is, has a place in, um, in families and certainly not with your children. Um, do we manipulate sometimes? Um, some people would say forced choices when you know that you don't mind if they wear this or this and you give them a choice. Some people would say, well, that's manipulation. Um, you know, I, I don't think that there, there's really a pro to that. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that um, hopefully in this, you're seeing that it's important for you to start identifying and maybe even looking at, wow, maybe I am more, you know, when you are being that way, either passive aggressive, manipulative or submissive, this 
this might be something that I want to look at and, and try to be more genuine in my communication. Kids pick up on genuine communication very easily. They know when you care and you don't, um, or when you're brushing them off or, or when you're really interested. Um, the reason I asked that is because, uh, oh, another uh, last thing, um, family meetings are, are a very good thing. I don't know if any of you have them on a regular basis or maybe impromptu, but especially as your kids get older, um, this is, is something we talk about in the Strengthening Families program that I've helped facilitate. Um, when th These are not to be talking about very serious things, but more schedules and being proactive with your communication. As your ch kids get older, they can um, have more input into decisions um, and how you're going to do things um, in your family. So having starting those off very early on with your children um, can make it just the that every, you know, we just know that every Sunday at six, we have a family meeting and it just becomes second nature um, to have those meetings. And it's a nice place to communicate. Um, remember, it's all a work in progress. Um, we are not going to be perfect at anything and nor should we expect our children to be. So as much as we slip up in our communication. We are looking for balance and on, on the balance of things, we'd like to be communicating uh, in a healthy manner with our children. We are gonna, I will say that one of the things to do when you feel you have not communicated in a healthy manner, and maybe you have had a freak out, there is nothing wrong with apologizing and processing that with your kids. Um, it's very helpful. I suggest that, that you use that as a teaching moment that, you know, I really had a meltdown and this is what was going on with me. And I was feeling this, this, and this, and I didn't respond well. And I apologize for that. And I'm going to try to do better um, because you want to model that for your children so that when they are having those, those meltdowns, that they can come back to you and, and do that. Progress is not linear. You're not going to see you know, oh, we're doing so much better. This is just gonna all go like this. It's gonna go up and then you're gonna take a backslide and then it's gonna go up again and backslide. That's okay. Um, we're just always striving to get a little bit better. Keep trying with good intentions. I think good intentions go a long way. And I think sometimes we're not honest about our intentions, especially when we're communicating with our significant others. Um, that, uh, implies a level of honesty with yourself that you can um, be honest with what you're really trying to communicate and what you're trying to do with that communication. If you feel you're not making progress on your own or that you feel like, well, this would have been good to hear a long time ago, but things are really out of kilter in our families right now and I, I need outside help, reach out for help. Um, contact your school counselor. Um, contact. Uh, we have a great uh, resource on the Westchester website. If you go um, onto uh, the Westchester website, there is a counseling library that we have a lot of resources. We have them divvied up by elementary, middle school, and high school. Um, that and Many of your school counselors will have that link on their signature page, um, on, their, on their email signature. Um, use that those resources. But if you don't have a, a pediatrician is a great place for resources as well. Um, but certainly I put my name on here. You can reach out to me, but each of you has a great counselor or counselors at your building who have a number of resources for you to reach out to. So um, I just ask you to um, continue to um, be working on this. And I would really love to have some questions so that we can make this so, more. Important. I have a little bit for you. One uh, was someone asking about the resources for tonight. I do want to let everyone know that this presentation is being recorded. So you will find it. Loretta will send out to you uh, where you can find it on the YouTube channel for Westchester Communities That Care. So you'll be able to look at that. Um, I love this question. It says, how do you avoid asking questions when you're really concerned as a parent? Mm -hmm. Example, you have a kid who's doing poorly in school. Okay. Well, that's a really good question. But again, looking at your intentions and what you're trying to get out of this, maybe start with the end in mind. I want to find out what's going on here. 
if think of yourself, if somebody asks you too much, many questions in a too aggressive of a way, what happens to you? You shut down or you lie or you, you know, you, you do a duck, dodge and hide. Um, you don't want to put your child on the uh, d defensive. So if you're concerned, better to ask an open-ended question and get them talking and at all times, <laughs> this is hard, not to judge. So I'll, I'll give an example of it. I, I try to um, show parents maybe how to use power school a little bit you know so a lot of times you guys will find that out when you get your monday or friday or every other day whatever you get reports on power school or parent portal whatever you call it um and you go to that and immediately look at you know all the grades and you're like what happened here well best to do what teachers and good managers do the sandwich do a positive a negative and a positive so Look at all the good things that are happening. So if you're concerned about something that's going on at school, try to find something they're doing well at. You can use that as a springboard to say, wow, you're really doing pretty well in social studies. How are you doing that? Rather than you're not doing well in math, what's going on? Try to get them to look at what they're doing right in an area. And then, then you can bring in, oh, so you ask a lot of questions of that? person? Do you do that in math? No. Well, why not? You know, I see that you're not doing as well in math here. I will also tell you a great technique, guys, is to be very nonchalant and very um, almost play dumb. So it's kind of like you scratch your head. You know, what's going on here? There's a different tone of you're not doing well in math. What's going on? Then, hmm, I'm looking at your grades here. You're doing really well in social studies and science, but math, not so much. Um, tell me about social studies and science. Get them talking. Okay, so now they're talking. So let's talk about math. I mean, look at my face. What do you, what's going on there? Can you tell me more about that? Well, I just don't get math. Oh, it sounds like you're really frustrated in math. Are you frustrated? You kind of join them in the problem rather than being the interrogator and trying to um, trying to attack them for it because you're going to get more from them if you keep the emotion out of it and get them talking. Too many questions. I know it's really hard. You want to get to the core of it really quick. The other thing is if, if it's something with school, you can always contact the counselor or the teachers and find out more information before you have that conversation so you can you can kind of probe in a way you already know what's going on, but you want them to tell you. So you, you kind of come in the back door with it. Does that answer your question? I hope maybe. Uh, it does. We just got a new question in saying, should you reach out to your child's teacher if you know that they're struggling in a subject? Yes. Um, I, I think that if you know they're struggling, Here's the deal, guys. Um, as counselors, we know your children at school. You are there, and we see them a lot. So we have a lot of information about how they're doing in school. But you know them the best. Um, they're going to tell you things they don't tell the teacher or a counselor. So what I find is it's imperative for us to talk to parents because we may give you a puzzle piece, part of the puzzle that you go, huh, we were seeing the same thing here. Same with you. You might talk to a, a, a teacher and say, well, this is what I'm seeing and this is what they're telling me. And it might be, ah, this makes sense now. Um, I don't think there's anything I know. And I was a, a, a parent in the district. You don't want to be that parent that's, you know, always talking. You know, but teachers don't mind. Teachers want your kids to be successful. So if you think they're struggling in a subject, they think they're struggling, too. Um, so there should be communication going on. And if you're not getting it from the teacher, contact them again. Communication is tone um, and, and, and the words. But, you know, short and simple, I think my child is struggling in, in your class. Not sure what's going on. Can you tell me what you're seeing? That's all. 
You know, you don't have to go on and on and on and da 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 da. da. Start the conversation. They may say, I don't see them struggling. That fits into expectations too, because I mean, I had a, a parent contact me today who wants to do more with their child at home with certain subjects that their child has A's in everything. And I'm like, what, you know, I don't know. Sometimes expectations are different with, uh, with the teacher and the parent, but that can be a conversation to be had. But yes, yes, yes. I think you contact a teacher if you're concerned about a subject. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with contacting your counselor. Um, I always tell a parent to, if it's a teacher related question, I don't need to be the middle person, but you know, so go to them. But if you're not hearing from them, come to me and, and I can facilitate that conversation um, or CC me so I know what's going on. Um, the counselors in your building are there to help with those kinds of things. Anything else? Does any of this- I do not have any more questions at this time. And, and, I, and I wish I could hear from people, but I guess I, I won't if, if any of this made sense or was helpful. Um, I'm just going on blind faith that it was. Um, it was, it was helpful it was. for me, Mike. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say we. Someone we're, put in the chat makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and, I, uh, we're getting super amazing. You're mate. She's amazing. Oh, Very oh, helpful. I wasn't fishing <laughs> Thanks. for compliments. Shall I download the chat for you? <laughs> no, I just I, I I wasn't fishing for compliments. I just that's why I like to do this in person because I like to be able to to read people's emotions and to be able to ask you, I think it's easier to ask questions in person, but that's okay. So if, if you found it helpful, super. Um, and I appreciate your attention and I hope it was, I hope it was helpful. It was very good. I want to remind everybody again, just about um, a couple of the things we have coming up. November 30th, our um, QPR suicide prevention training. Uh, that is going to be in person at the Spellman Education Center in Exton. Um, just the nature of the content is pretty heavy, obviously, suicide prevention. Um, but given everything that's going on with our youth and mental health um, over the last couple of years, we are really hoping to get a tur good turnout for that. And we want people to um, understand what their kids are learning when they go through this um, training at school and also, you know, to use in your own lives. It's a great, it's a great resource. Um, and then again, our, on December 3rd is our parent outreach meeting. Um, we're looking to get a representative from each school, um, so that, um, these conversations are continuing out in each of our communities and our neighborhoods and all that. Uh, and then again, the youth, um, Martin Luther King, uh, leadership day uh, for any kids eighth through twelfth grade. Uh, Carol, Carol, can I yes. um, just have you answer one more question for us? Yes. Uh, can you explain the use of the safe word again? Uh, oh, that the, was, that, the question that, person said I had a little drama here and missed it. Yes, we do have <laughs> drama in, in her. Um, Yes, um, that was just for um, if you if you feel or your child feels that you're an overreactor um, or, or, you know, th that you get the sense that your kids don't maybe come to you all the time because they're afraid of your reaction. Um, that's just a proactive thing to use with your kids to say, you know what, Let, let's come up with a safe word that you can use if you want to tell me something, but you're afraid of what my reaction is going to be. It's good for me, you because then you're more comfortable. And it's good for me because it gives me a chance to kind of step back and say, okay, go ahead, tell me, I can do it, I can take it. Um, so it, it just models that stop and think a little bit for your kids too, which is, is a good thing for them to know. Thank you for taking the extra minute to answer that. Sure. Okay. I'm done. Carol, thank you so much for joining us. This was great. Wow. Such an important topic. So glad okay. that you were able to, to take some time out of your schedule for us. Okay. Thank you. Thank have you, everyone. Good, have a good night, everybody. Bye.